Viewer discretion is advised. Four, the New America As far as the eye could see, fire spread across the vast forest. Bamboo, cypress, and cedar trees all shifted in shape and size as the heat from the intense fire warped its surrounding environment. Over these flames, like a lucid dream teetering on the brink of insanity, a large blow-up sex doll floated gently above the burning trees, melting into its slow demise amidst the fiery ground below. And while the fire blazed, the cracking sounds of ember and burning vegetation could be heard, along with the soft whistling winds off into the distance. All this while pieces of shredded currency gently danced in the breeze, and seeming completely out of place and unscathed by the blaze all around. Just overhead stood a billboard of a cartoon cow, smiling while drinking a large glass of refreshing milk. Trevor was dreaming. His eyes twitched this way and that, as he laid still strapped to the observation table. A medical team, meanwhile, keeping a close eye on him. It appeared Trevor was finally in somewhat good hands. One could only hope that Caleb and Delilah were in similar conditions, or at the very least, still alive. Present day, Tunja, Colombia. Nearly a thousand miles northeast of the town of Esmeralda, as the Chancellor walked into the abandoned Capitol building, he noticed immediately that it was a far cry from the town he had grown to love over all these years. This Capitol, however, was still quite large, as it was made up of a sprawling community of smaller buildings, now all appearing to be victims to the world they found themselves in. After years of neglect, and no one to call it their home, the compound had clearly fallen prey to nefarious transients and desperate scavengers. Not being made of the same tasteful Spanish design that they were accustomed to, the property boasted of heavy-duty modulars and a large site-built office building that they were currently securing in the center. The place was run down and cluttered with what appeared to be old empty bottles of alcohol as his men began to clear each room. Suddenly, the sounds of a female screaming emanated throughout the building's cheaply crafted architecture. In a room near the other side of the building, two Russian soldiers were taking advantage of a local woman that was caught off guard. They had her pinned over a tattered desk, one of the soldiers holding her down from behind while she cried. Suddenly, catching the other soldier who was waiting his turn by surprise, the Russian assaulting the poor woman fell to the floor followed by the sounds of gunfire. As the smoke from his gun was still drifting out from the barrel, the Russian, who was spared for the moment, hurriedly buckled his pants and saluted the Chancellor as their victim ran out, out of the room. The Chancellor, having now earned several of his men's undivided attention, as they slowly poured into the room, 
spoke loudly as he turned to look at his higher ranking officers. Until we have our shipment completely taken care of, I want all of you to know that all extracurricular activities are hereby suspended. The Chancellor allowed a moment to pass as he stared at his men through the silence. Then he turned and walked out of the room. He meant business as this was his last chance to claim his piece of the world, slowly unfolding around him and quickly becoming occupied by his competition. He knew that his alliance with the oligarchy that he had secured decades earlier was coming to an end. He watched over the years as the Americans slowly took over their contracts here in the South and were somehow conducting their business completely off their radars. He knew one day his time would come. So he prepared. He knew all the places to seek out should that day ever arrive. Then he equipped various locations between Esmeralda and these key locations with fuel and other supplies his faction had earned through his old contracts. But he also had other plans. Should this day come to pass, he would annex the outnumbered Russians in his operation and strike out on his own, creating an empire that would rival the one he long left behind before the world went dark. But he would need a way to keep supplies coming in. He would have to secure a new channel to this one client that seemed to hold all the cards. And with his knack at espionage, the Chancellor did precisely that. He knew from way back when he was first locked up by Thomas Shields as a gift from the Sinaloa to the US government that the United States military had stumbled across technologies seemingly out of this world. Suddenly, a portion of the Americans were able to move freely around all the cartel security systems as they were systematically exterminated. What he did not realize was that there was a difference between the Americans that sought his demise and the ones that competed for the contracts. One of these factions was known as the Last State, which was still trying to piece together its remaining democratic bloodlines of the United States. The other faction, however, was led by Arlo and Lenkov, the same men leading the cartels. It was by far the largest contractor for the Russians. And because the Russians had taken advantage of the inability for militaries to properly communicate amongst themselves after the bombs had dropped, they quickly secured the larger portion of the US military, under the notion that they were actually being led by the true US government. These Americans were by far the Russians' strongest contractor, and this faction. This unwittingly rogue American faction was simply called the New America. The Russians had themselves a monopoly and unlike other contractors working for them, the Chancellor knew it and this did not sit well with him. Unified with other oligarchies, the Russians secured contracts just like this with other militaries and mercenaries around the world, designating zones for each. And one of these oligarchs, Kostyalenkov, was currently attempting to rein in one of their rogue cartel leaders. The Chancellor only had one option. He had to tap into this supply chain that the oligarchs had under lock and key. With his kingpin-like instincts, always striving to be the one on top, he knew that in order to stake his claim in this new cutthroat industry and not wanting to work for the oligarchs directly, giving his outfit the ability to call its own shots, he would have to start by working out a deal. He would have to somehow covertly cooperate with the new America, being careful not to let word get to his old bosses. Once with enough supplies, he would be able to claim said stake. He would have to find a way to carve out a hidden channel, opening a dedicated network just for his benefit. In order to complete such a task, he would have to secure his own contracts. He knew this would be risky. But for any gangster, nothing is too risky when the rewarded rises to the top. So, taking advantage of a small window of opportunity before fleeing the town of Esmeralda, the Chancellor made a desperate move 
and sent one of his messengers to arrange a meeting with the Americans in question. This new America. He knew there was bad blood between him and this potential client he had his sights set on, having raided their operations in the recent past for supplies, secretly building a supply network behind the oligarch's back. But he still felt somewhat confident. And that confidence came from a strong contact he had within the new America itself. And to the Chancellor's surprise, he found himself correct in his hypothesis, as he was able to gain the Americans' interest, as they promptly accepted his request. They wished to place an order with the cartel faction, and they agreed to do this covertly, as they saw this as purely transactional. They gave the Chancellor ten days to fill the order. One condition applied. He was to bring the shipment to the Americans alone. It was his only chance. The Chancellor was going to roll the dice. He would meet these Americans alone, but he would strategically place his armies near the meeting spot if anything were to go sour. And knowing that he was surrounded by recently commandeered Russian soldiers, and that him and his brother were the only ones that knew the coordinates of the meeting's location, he knew that he was playing it smart. As he held firmly onto a folded piece of notebook paper, he was soon alerted to his radio, sounding off in the adjacent room. The Chancellor made his way to his radio and picked it up as he held down a button off to the side. What is it? A voice over the radio made the Chancellor's blood boil over with anger as it announced to him the unwanted news. It's Meeks, sir. We have word he survived. No one is exactly sure where he is, sir. Over. The Chancellor squeezed the folded paper into a crumpled mess as he placed the radio back on the desk. The man on the other end kept speaking as the Chancellor angrily stormed out of the room. Sir, do you copy, sir? Meanwhile, light years across the universe. Trevor had been woken up from a strange dream by a very attractive, and petite female, appearing to be in her thirties. She was undoing his straps. As she finished undoing the strap that had been restraining his left arm, he half swung his fist and slightly sat up. The female jerked back and grabbed a clipboard she'd had resting on the side of the bed and watched Trevor carefully at a distance. She was assuming he would come to his senses and soon calm down. Trevor eased up as he studied the stranger and soon became more comfortable with the situation, so he began to relax, allowing her to proceed in undoing his restraints. While she did so, she addressed Trevor in a way that felt as if she were continuing a conversation, not starting one. Was she talking to me in my sleep? He thought as she spoke. Anyway, you have to write them down, you know. Trevor threw the female a confused expression while rubbing his wrists and sitting up. He was still wearing the same clothing that he had on the previous night. At least he was hoping it had been the previous night, not knowing how long he had been out for. She continued to speak, forming a smile as she did so. The dreams. There's always a detail in them that seems unimportant. But in your case, the smallest details could be the difference of life or death. She looked around and once she felt safe from prying ears. She leaned in slightly as she used a warm cloth to wipe Trevor's wrists from their recent sticky confines. They said they had found one. His name is Trevor Meeks, they told us. I didn't believe them. But then, she put a finger on Trevor's nose and said a few final words. Here you are as she smiled at him with wonderment in her eyes. Trevor looked at her like she was currently growing a second head. At that point, they were interrupted by the gentleman he had spoken to the night before, looking down on him. As said before, he was tall and slender, but now being able to make out the rest of him, his face appeared quite unique, his features very sharp, his tone of skin very light, with thoughtful, vibrant blue eyes. This, however, went well with his neatly trimmed silver goatee, which he sported at the crux of his face. 
the stranger entered the room with two very familiar men who remained at either side. It was the same men that had intercepted Trevor from Agent Shields just the day before. These two and Kit all wore thin clothing that appeared to be handmade. The pants were very loose, and each of them also wore thin shirts roughly stitched from pieces of cloth. Their clothing was of a brown and tan material, somewhat resembling a uniform. The four looked at Trevor as the one that seemed to be in charge began to speak. That's Kit. These two gentlemen you have already met, Kristoff and Jacob. My name is Lucas. The man then looked at Trevor and not seeming to waste any time, showing a serious sense of urgency. Lucas spoke up once more. Okay, Mr. Meeks, come on, let's go. It's time for you to see where you actually are. Moments later, Trevor found himself inside an elevator. He didn't have the energy to make the obvious sarcastic comment this situation had provided for him, but the thought had crossed his mind. This elevator didn't seem to bother him, however, as everything around him seemed to be top-of-the-line equipment with state-of-the-art technologies. Everything was brightly lit and clearly marked. The floors and walls gleamed with a glossy shine as the elevator itself effortlessly climbed a few stories. What is this place? Trevor finally asked as his voice cracked slightly from being mostly unused as of late. Lucas looked over at Trevor. You're inside our only outpost here. You are inside, Prometheus. Trevor looked at him, confused, as Lucas continued. There's only about 3,000 of us now. But the more we learn about the domes, and how to get people out, the more our numbers grow. Trevor, deep in thought, did not understand what Lucas was referring to when he spoke of the domes. Just then, the elevator doors opened, leading to a large, bright, empty room. The room seemed to serve as a command center, as several men and women in familiar uniforms stood watch at computers that monitored their outside surroundings. Trevor soon found himself high in a mountain range, peering over what looked like large domes that lined the terrain for hundreds of miles in all directions. That's when Lucas spoke up again. You were led to believe that you were rescued by your American homeland. No, Mr. Meeks. Unfortunately, the Americans are up to something entirely different these days. He walked toward the large window with Trevor and the others following closely behind. Sure, there's some shadow of the remaining US government fighting somewhere back on Earth. They call themselves the last state. In fact, that's who we were trying to get you to. You know, when Kit sent you that message through Delilah. That was when Kit chimed in. I said, stay off the roads. You were supposed to be picked up by salvation. Not these assholes, she said, while peering out the window down at the cement confines. That was when Trevor, looking at Kit with even more confusion now, but remembering Delilah's warning on staying off the roads, looked over to Lucas for an explanation. Lucas looked out the window, cueing Trevor to do the same as he continued to speak. You were supposed to be picked up by the last state. Of course, they had no idea who you were. We made certain they didn't. Every soldier in the last state has one weakness. Trevor, looking out the window, looked over at Lucas. Then Lucas continued. They're human. And as he proceeded to explain things to Trevor, they both looked back out the window. You should have been diverted to a safe haven in what used to be America. The last state's only stronghold. Instead, you were intercepted. Intercepted and brought here. Brought here by a ship called Sanctuary. Arlo's little gift to mankind's persistence. The ship mimics salvation's every move, intercepting as many people, or cattle, as they call them, along the way. Lucas then paused for a second, looked at Trevor and then back out the window. This is the real America now, Mr. Meeks. This 
That is the new America. Trevor looked at the infinite compound of cement structures just outside, as Lucas continued. With the alliance of this large fraction of the U.S. military, unwittingly turned mercenaries, led by a man named Arlo Brooks, they built this planet together over the last century. Trevor, still extremely confused, looked out the window. Besides the domes, the planet looked somewhat similar to an earthly desert. But then, that was when he noticed two very small distant suns that pulsated along with the larger sun that appeared closer than ever. Lucas waved his hand at the glass as a few of the domes became highlighted, eventually leaving only one highlighted as Lucas continued. Ah, there it is. C-61. Trevor looked as if he had not the slightest clue of what he was seeing outside the window. C-61 is where your new home was. It's where Caleb and Delilah are right now. Don't worry, Mr. Meeks, he said, noting Trevor's expression change as the conversation breached the topic of his estranged family. They will be fine. They won't be for long, however, if we don't get to the bottom of things. And in doing so, we need your help. He waved his hand again at the glass, and suddenly Trevor jumped at his next words. That's Darius. Lucas smiled. That's the Darius that Kristoff told you about. It was just Earth to you before that. Remember? A sanctuary, they told you. Suddenly the screen zoomed out of the structure and through its thick concrete exterior, exposing the entire terrain of thousands of city-sized domes. And now, with the view back to the same bright blue skies with three suns and a landscape of infinite deserts and rolling sand dunes, Lucas went on. This is Darius Trevor, part of a three-star system known as Alpha Centauri. This is where billions of humans have come and gone over the better part of the last century. He stated as Trevor saw the bright blue skies and endless plains of sand topped with the Hulk-like structures, while Lucas continued to educate him. At first, they just bred the human product here. At that time, there were only two domes. That was long ago, before civilization was wiped from the face of the earth. But after executing a multi-pronged attack on the human race, their opportunity came and they got to work. The thousands of structures you see here today were built to receive Earth's very first export. Trevor, though things were clearly adding up, maintained his best what-the-fuck expression. He carefully listened to Lucas, who continued giving him a rundown, shedding light on the current affairs that crashed against all his logical barriers and shattered across his racing mind. Over a century ago, a species we have yet to fully comprehend stumbled across mankind. They seemed to be seeking a safe haven, as they had been nearly wiped out. This species can actually endure the vacuum of space, so you could imagine their surprise when they found our planet to be toxic to them. You see, the Earth is full of life. Life that you can see from the heavens. Life that freely grows upon the entire rock. Our friends here. This species that caused all of this. They seem to be allergic to Earth. And seeing them thrive on a planet bereft of anything living, it appears as though they have an allergy to life itself. The Russians were able to communicate with them first. We are not sure what happened, but somewhere along the way, the United States, after losing several top officials, including the president, lost control over their militaries, as the Russians now had the upper hand. And now, rogue Americans have their own contracts with the visitors. And these contracts are in unison with their once longtime adversaries, Russia. Trevor looked at Lucas, suspicious of the answer, but needing to hear it anyway. Contracts for what? Lucas looked at his two bodyguards, and then back at Trevor. Cattle, more specifically, human cattle. Just as mankind has herded its own cattle on their home planet, 
these friends of ours are herding mankind to theirs. It appears a saying could be reversed. As below, so above. Trevor felt sick as he looked out the window at the vast terrain of organized domes. While he stared out into the distance, Lucas kept speaking. We lost count, but we're pretty sure that there's three to four hundred million at any given time. The product moves in and out rather quickly. Trevor looked at Lucas with a face that begged him to stop. Lucas instead just clarified his last remark, emphasizing to Trevor the twisted truth. Cattle. Three to four hundred million. Human. Cattle. In those cement domes. At any given time. Sure, the virus made people sick at first. But this was just the beginning. The virus never killed anybody. The bodies that they claimed they burned in order to sanitize and bury the growing numbers of deceased humans were never actually bodies in the first place. They were just very sick people. And when the symptoms passed, they simply ended up here, where they were convinced that this was the last place on Earth, free from all the chaos. Then, just as planned, after the world went dark, importing cattle became exceedingly easy as they simply shifted their grift to the guise of a massive evacuation plan to save mankind. New additions would only fuel the lies, depicting a bleak existence outside the sanctuary to others living within. A real recipe for docile and calm cattle. That's when Trevor started to grow visually pale and began to grasp his hair, simply to keep his head upright. Lucas, not wavering to Trevor's emotions, and instead pressed on. They catalogued all of us through the virus. A virus that came from them. It came from one of the first aliens to die without being properly disposed of. Properly disposed of? Trevor asked, finally beginning to comprehend a fraction of the gravity of the situation he found himself in. Lucas moved the conversation forward, answering Trevor's question along the way. That's right. The visitor that died was actually meant to live. Live long enough to make its way through a few communities anyway. Devouring any human in its path. When it was killed, however, all the US government had to do to stop this Russian agenda was to properly dispose of this creature's body. Instead, for some reason, we still don't quite understand. The units tasked with this operation simply stood down. We think this occurred near one of the American underground labs in Ecuador. The virus then spread rapidly across the atmosphere from just that one carcass, becoming a tiny part of all of us. As it spread, it acted as a virus. It was this virus that we thought plagued us with death for so many years. A virus that tracked us. A virus that controlled us. A virus, however, that somehow didn't work on 7% of the population. Trevor looked as if he had questions, so Lucas guided him through it. For example, Mr. Meeks. The strange figures you see are just a software program that can only affect other software programs. Suddenly, an image came up over the window. It was an image that Trevor grew tired of. It was an image of the tall, dark creature that constantly stalked him. Lucas continued, Take Kit here, for instance. Trevor looked over at Kit as she flashed him a goofy grin. Kit is not part of that 7%. Therefore, the software within her DNA from the virus now permanently engraved within us all is much stronger than it is within you. She is affected by the figures. These cattle guards. But she would never even know it. It causes the affected to avoid the cattle guard, avoid it, and stay away from it. They cannot see it. And it would take some serious convincing to direct a human who is affected by the virus into walking toward a cattle guard. Their subconscious just won't let them. They are there to guard you in. 
they are there to guard you out. But most importantly, they are there to guard their product. The ones that are not affected, this 7% have often reported actually seeing these same dark figures, some even having personal encounters with a cattle guard from time to time. After speaking his last words, Trevor recognized the direction the conversation was heading in, as he recollected a particular dream he once had. They attempted to slaughter everyone not infected, the 7% that they have no control over, and they were almost successful. He said as he paused and peered over at Trevor, many think this seven, as they are called, are reborn. In order to keep the seven under control, there are those tasked with seeking out the seven and eliminating them. Pest control. Lucas then sighed with a hint of frustration. The last state doesn't have the slightest clue as to what's really going on. That's why we have formed this outfit. We have connections far and wide. We are able to obtain supplies right under the nose of our adversaries. But in order to complete our mission, we have to see the cattle guard. And right when we track down a seven to recruit, they simply disappear, fall into one of Arlo's exterminators. He then peered over at Trevor. Trevor, you are the only one we know of. And now, you are the only one here that can see the cattle guard. It goes without saying, if they know what you are, the enemy would eliminate you immediately. With that, Kit finally spoke up and interjected with what she thought was an amusing anecdote. They say there's a place in China where there are millions of them guarding something massive. She smiled as she said this, baring her pearly white teeth as if she were regaling the group with a fun story. Looking at her while half smiling and half attempting to understand her strangely happy behavior, Trevor shifted his eyes to Lucas for confirmation. But Kit's peculiar and happy demeanor caused him to throw her one more confused stare. But then, looking back to Lucas, he shook off her goofy disposition once more as her superior confirmed to him what she had said about China. We believe that's where the real threat is. But we won't know until someone can breach the cattle guards to see what's on the other side. But with that many guards, no amount of convincing would work on any human. Trevor changed his view to the window once more. It was a daunting enough task to keep his family alive, and he felt that he had miserably failed at that. So, it went without saying that pondering this thought made him doubt the possibility that he could be humanity's savior as he thought to himself. He looked around, shaking his lack of confidence as he attempted to change the subject. How do we even get back to Earth anyway? Lucas then responded without hesitation. We were hoping you'd already be there. We had contacts on Earth, ready to recruit you. But since you were intercepted and brought here, we'll have to get you back. Then it was Kit's turn as she spoke up. Oh, that's the most exciting part. Lucas then looked away and let Kit take over as he knew she loved this part. So, space is like this flat piece of something, right? Like the flattest of flat. It's totally like flatter than you ever thought flat could be. Seriously, Trev, there's like a fucking science dedicated to being flat. Trevor's head spun by an induced whiplash. Her explanation swiftly dulled out. Anyway, stay with me, Trev. So, on top of being flat, it's totally flexible too, right? And the best part is, with the right electricity and trajectory, you could fold it up and put it in your pocket. Seriously, you could like go across the whole fracking universe in just seconds. You just need a box and some yellow gel shit. Lucas looked at Trevor, apologizing with his facial expression for the headache he knew Trevor must have by now. Compliments of Kit's explanation. Just then, during their hidden exchange, Kit looked at Lucas, catching him off guard. But Lucas quickly changed his facial expression, not wanting to offend her, and flashed her a smile right back as she did a little bounce and giggled. 
She might not fully understand it, but she loved the science stuff. Lucas looked at Trevor with a small smile and gave some more direction to him. All right then, let's get you out of here. Trevor immediately slammed on the brakes as he spoke at a significantly higher register. Wait, now, he said, as it seemed as if they were rushing into things a little too fast for him. Lucas looked at Trevor, just smiled. Yes, Mr. Meeks, right now. Trevor followed Lucas and Kit as Kristoff and Jacob stayed back. On the way to where Trevor assumed he would be readied for departure, he learned more about his upcoming journey. Apparently, having just learned this new technology, humans have yet to master this type of transportation. Ergo, a rough landing was in store for him. To be more exact, landing in a precise location was what humans were still trying to figure out. But for now, a minor setback like this would simply have to be an acceptable aspect of the job as man's survival depended on the operation in question. The three of them then moved on to another room within the highest level of Prometheus. Once in the smaller room, resembling something out of a science fiction movie, Trevor stood in a chamber that had four capsules with sliding doors all ajar. Each was standing tall, paired off, facing each other two by two. Computers and equipment lined the walls around them, as the ceiling was hidden under a layer of silver and copper ducting. The floor itself appeared to be made of glass with a golden-like surface underneath, while the capsules themselves seemed to be a smooth titanium-like material. Trevor was directed by Kit into one of the capsules as he stepped inside. Once standing within it, a smiling Kit waved to him as the door closed and safety restraints automatically strapped him in his seat. On the door now closed in front of him, there was a small window. Over this window, on the inside, hung a curtain made of plastic that was lowered, not allowing him to see Lucas or Kit. And just above this, on the interior walls above the window itself, sat a light shining with a dull red glow. Lucas talked to Trevor from the outside, while he sat at a large screen and punched in the coordinates of where Trevor would be going. We will be sending you to the Philippines first, where you will meet one of our contacts, Logan, for supplies. Once you depart, you will no longer be able to communicate with Prometheus. But don't worry, you won't be going alone. Trevor was alarmed by these last words, so he quickly opened the window to his capsule and saw what Lucas was talking about. Across from Trevor's capsule was another one that faced his. Inside of that window, was an adorable, smiling kit who threw him a wave while visually bouncing with excitement. Trevor began protesting right away, but suddenly he felt wetness around his ankles, causing him to look down for a further inspection. He noticed that the capsule was being filled with a thick, amber liquid. As uncomfortable as the gel-like substance was, seeming to fill the entire capsule quickly, he was unable to resist as his restraints kept him firmly in place. Lucas then spoke with a soothing voice from just outside while this continued to take place. The liquid forming at your feet has a highly concentrated chemical in it. It's a much more passive compound we found in DX4 gas, an element we discovered here on Darius. It won't cause you any pain or discomfort, I assure you. He looked back up and out of the window with a confused expression when he noticed a gas rising from the thick amber liquid below. Slowly, as the gas filled his chamber, he looked across to see Kit slowly pass out as her chamber was also now being filled with the same similar mist. Then, as the gas overtook his entire ability to see through its thick fog, it was lights out for one Mr. Trevor Meeks. And once he was within the safety of the thick protective liquid, now nearly filling his entire chamber, the light above his now unconscious head turned a solid green. Now for an apology, as to avoid a long science lesson while sharing this story of twists and turns, one might summarize instead the events that began unfolding from the pair's spaceship-like departure, as those very events began filling the skies of Darius just outside. As Kit had so well put it, 
just moments before. The folding of space and time happens in a fraction of a fraction of a millisecond. And of course, having said this, it would go without saying that completing such a task would cause a slight disturbance around such an astronomical event. For at this moment in time, the fallout of Trevor and Kit's departure caused a brief flash above the mountains in which they had been covertly nestled. In fact, one would compare this flash to a solar flare seen so many times throughout our universe. And this solar flare flashed across the skies of Darius with such a force that upon a closer look, it effortlessly lit up a nefarious ongoing upon the desert below. This bright pulse of magnetic energy seen as light caught the attention of one particular person on the ground. And then this flash happened to light up this person along with one other near a large all-terrain vehicle. And this vehicle sat just outside a large firestorm that seemed to be approaching the two figures, one kneeling over the other that seemed bound and gagged. But as one would surely digress, they would find themselves unable to do so, as this half-attempted science lesson is not quite through. The human species is vulnerable, and in order to avoid utter extinction, it is inevitable that, as a species, spreading across the stars lay in their future. Having said this, most scholars agree that even within a controlled environment, traversing the stars is likely able to take a harsh toll on the human body. This was all too apparent to Trevor, as he found himself coming to, having the unnerving feeling of being mid-upchuck from acid reflux that had begun within his liquid-induced hypersleep. With the solid plastic curtain now closed in front of him, Trevor assumed he was smelling his own vomit as he heard his capsule decompress and his restraints disengage. Eventually, his capsule door slid up and open as he tumbled to a red carpet below, meeting Kit face to face, both on their hands and knees after losing their balance. Red carpet, Trevor thought, looking directly below him as he again lost his proverbial lunch all over the bright and once clean rug, now just underneath. As he regained his balance, attempting to stop the world from turning, he heard Kit seemingly try to get his attention as she politely proceeded in clearing her throat. As he looked up at her, he noticed she was observing their surroundings, so he joined her in doing so. And making his heart jump, he quickly noted several very serious-looking Japanese men, all in suits. They were looking at them as if they were aliens from another planet, having just traveled through space. And the summation of their expressions were not far off. They were standing in a large room that had massive glass walls, separating them from the exterior woodland outside. Suddenly, and in unison, all the men withdrew pistols from their coat pockets and pointed them at the two ETs. Trevor threw his hands up and looked over at Kit, who seemed to be having the time of her life, with the largest smile now quickly spreading across her childlike face. She looked at Trevor, now with her hands up over her head as well, and gave him her famous giggle he was becoming all too familiar with. Trevor stood there, in fear of what now surrounded him, but growing more perplexed by his new companion's strange behavior and rolled his eyes.